Hello, everyone. John Drummond here, your host for the TNT show every Wednesday at 7 p.m. on Indie Live. And this week, 7 p.m. on Wednesday, we have special guest Karen Van Sweden. Because we have had so, so many questions as a result of Tim Rideout's uh, appearance last week uh, on the subject of the best currency arrangements for independent Scotland, uh, we've invited Karen to join us on Wednesday. And she's going to be talking about the work of the Scottish Currency Group. So get your questions in now, please. If you're concerned, stroke interested on the best arrangements, currency arrangements for independent Scotland, now's the time to put the questions. Scotland needs independence, perhaps now more than ever. But to be truly independent, we need our own currency to direct, nurture and grow our own resources. And our real resources are our land, our water, our abundance of energy and the people who live in Scotland. Scotland, our home, not a UK power brand. We can mobilise all of our resources for Scotland with the fiscal and monetary tools of any normal independent country. And at Modern Money Scotland, we aim to show you how. The What's On Guide to live stream events and shows is now available. You can find the guide on the web at independencelive.net, on multiple Facebook pages, or go direct with the web link tvl.ink forward slash what's on guide. This is a new voice for a new Scotland. We are an internet radio station and you can find us at www.indylive.radio. We are a community of volunteer broadcasters set up in 2019 to entertain and inform. Click on the schedule tab to find out what's on every day of the week. You'll see what a great variety of shows we have, and we're on 24-7. There's something for everyone, so please give us a try. We know you're busy people, so most of our shows are also on demand on our Scottish Independence podcast channel, available wherever you get your podcasts. Indie Live Radio is a new voice for a new Scotland. Join us. Thanks for listening. Indie Live The What's On Guide to live stream events and shows is now available. You can find the guide on the web at independencelive.net, on multiple Facebook pages, or go direct with the web link tvl.ink forward slash what's on guide.
What's On Guide to live stream events and shows is now available. You can find the guide on the web at independencelive.net, on multiple Facebook pages, or go direct with the web link tvl.ink forward slash What's On Guide. Hi there, I'm, I'm Cliff. And I'm Russ. And I'm, we're from the Veterans for Scottish Independence 2.0 group. And uh, we're just invading your privacy today to, to let you know that we will be uh, very shortly uh, pushing a program out on live stream uh, to do with uh, uh, the veterans, uh, their needs, uh, as it will be uh, during an independent campaign. Uh, sorry, the next independence campaign, uh, and indeed in independent Scotland. So get yourself in gear, come and join us, pull up a sandbag. Yes. Thank you. Cheers. Wherever you stand, get the fresh view of what's happening in Scotland with iScot. Celebrate everything about our country with intelligent, in-depth insight from lifestyle, culture to puzzles and all the opinions you'll need. Whether it's digital or by post, subscribe now to iScot. I've got a list at the side on my laptop just because there's so many myths within the orthodoxy. So I'm just going to list them first. <laughs> oh! I am John Drummond, your host for the next 60 exciting minutes. Good evening and welcome to the TNT show, The Nation Talks. You know, it's been another great day for British democracy. Today, an MSP uh, called Mandel was thrown out of the Holyrood Chamber for calling the First Minister a liar. Well, in fairness, he's probably in a better position to know a liar than most of us. As the old saying goes, the apple doesn't fall far from the tree. Thanks for joining us this evening. We have yet another great guest tonight, and I'm really excited that she's able to join us. Uh, she's the Executive Director of Modern Money Scotland, and she's going to tell you all about that shortly. And stay tuned to hear from somebody who's been thinking very, very seriously indeed about the currency in a newly independent Scotland. And we're taking your questions live. We've already had. Uh, six or seven questions in advance. Thank you for those, and we'll try and deal with as many of your questions as they come up as we possibly can. So, in many respects, as I often say, this is your show. You send the questions, we try and answer them. Talking, talking, talking to the nation tonight, the details are on your screen. If you need to contact us, you can email me direct, john at cliche.com. Don't hesitate. Now, to our guest tonight. The nation talks to Karen Van Sweden the first Leith convener to feature on the TNT show. How are you, Karen? How are you coping with the pandemic? 
Yeah, the pandemic, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's uh, difficult. Yeah, I have decided just this weekend that I uh, currently live in Edinburgh, as you know, in Leith, um, and I'm going to move back to Aberdeen um, because I can't see my family in the normal way that I do um, going up and down on the train. Um, I don't have a car, so I am going to move back because all my work is at home now. So it's it's had yeah it's had a massive effect on my life to be sure. Yeah. When was, when was the last time you met the family? I haven't seen my mum and my brother since March. Really? Mm-hmm. Why? Yeah, yeah. I mean, you you have to consider yourself a carrier at all times. Yeah. You know, unless you know that you're not. So. Um, I'm very conscious of the fact that even if I took a train, the, the chances of me picking up the virus are always there if I take it up to Aberdeen. Yeah. So, I, you know, that's how I view it. Mm-hmm. And, and once you move up there, how will you get together? You have to wear a mask or something. <laughs> or, or are you classified as one family then, as it were? Yeah, I think it'll be fairly safe for me to, to you know, form a bubble with my mum. Okay. Um, and maybe not both my brother and my mum. We'll have to think about that and decide on the risks and how they all want to go with the risks and think about that, yeah. But the beauty of it is you're almost face-to-face then, you're not down the other end of a line, you're not, it's just very awkward. Very yeah. Awkward. yeah. I, I've got family in Portugal and it's it's crazy. I mean, we, we can't get together at all. So we do FaceTime and we do all the rest of that good stuff. It's not the same. I'm sorry, it's not the same. But it's what it is, I'm afraid. Uh, Karen Van Sweden. Now, there's an interesting name. T- t- tell us how that came about, uh, about your background, where you were born, where you grew up, all of that good stuff, please. Okay, so I, I was born Karen Robertson. Um, I was born in Motherwell. My, my dad's from Motherwell, my mum's from Paisley. Um, we moved up to Aberdeen. My dad worked on the rigs. Uh, he was a welder, pipe fitter, fabricator. Um, he was also a uh, shop steward. He'd, uh, he'd done his apprenticeship in Ravenscraig and he'd been a shop steward there and he was a shop steward when we went on the rigs. Um, of course, the rigs were wild places um, with all kinds of dangers when he was working there. Um, and then uh, he was he was on the Piper Alpha a couple of weeks before the Piper Alpha um, exploded. He said it was the most dangerous rig he'd ever been on. Really? And he had an escape route worked out from every place that he worked on. So after the Piper Alpha, him and my mum were very much involved with beginning the Offshore Industrial Liaison Committee. Um, soon after that, my dad was blacked. Um, he was prevented from working offshore for a, for a long time. Um, happily, he had a friend who had a workshop onshore, so he worked for him latterly. But my mum remained the administrator for the Offshore Industrial Liaison Committee until she was retired. Um, it started off as, as a loose organisation, but it became a union. And more recently, it's been subsumed into the RMT. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's my family, my mum and dad. And my brother's a barber, and he's in Aberdeen as well. Um, my dad died last year in 2019. Um, for me, what have I done? I, how did I acquire the name Van Sweden? Well... Um, I married a Dutchman when I lived in the Netherlands, but that was fairly recently. I have moved around quite a lot. So I've lived in Edinburgh, I've lived in Glasgow, I've lived in London, and then I lived in the Netherlands. And that was where I met my husband. So that's how I've acquired my surname, uh, going from Robertson to Van Sweden. And then latterly, um, I've done lots of different types of work as well over the years. So I've got lots of different experiences experiences at different types of work but more recently I went to Dundee University started a life sciences degree um, and graduated with a degree in anatomical sciences in 2015 Um, and then soon after that about a year and a half after that I moved back to Edinburgh where I'd lived before Um, I run my own business I work for myself um, and I'm very active in the independence movement um, yes, I'm convener of Leith SNP. I'm convener of Yes Edinburgh North Leith. Um, yeah, I'm just very, very involved. So m- from there, that was where I started doing research into the economics of independence and um, was getting involved really in the Yes Edinburgh North Leith movement and in the SNP in Leith as well. Oh, that sounds very interesting. 
How's your Dutch? Ja, ik kan nog Nederlands spreken. Dat kan nog steeds. <laughs> ja. Maar ik ben nog steeds redelijk vloeiend. <laughs> Klopt. Dank je wel. Ik tried a little bit of Dutch. We used to have lots of Dutch clients, ING, Axel Nobel, TNT, uh, uh, the others uh, out there. And, uh, you know, it was, it, was, it was always interesting having conversations. The Dutch people were always at pains to say to me, you know, we're not Germans. You know, you, you do understand that. You know, yes, of course I understand that. Yeah, but lots of people don't. You know, we often have contact back in the UK and people say, well, uh, you know, Germans, Dutch, it's all much the same, you know, blah, blah, blah. I used to always tease them, though, because I think there's a whole stanza, at least a couple of lines in the Dutch national anthem, which refers to being of German blood. Um, so that, that was always a source of some, some teasing. Uh, well, incidentally, what did you do in, uh, in Netherlands? So first of all, I worked in a gym. Um, I've been a personal trainer for years. And that was why I decided to do an anatomical sciences degree, because I really wanted to get under the skin and see what was going on there. Um, so I was very lucky in the year that I went to um, Dundee University because they changed the method of preservation of the cadavers. So we went from using formalin to teal. So that was I was the first year that we did that. So um, that? It's, it might be a little bit distasteful for some people, but yeah, well, obviously you're if you're interested in how the human body works. <laughs> what is what is the difference? So with formalin, the bodies are like wax works. They're stiff. Um, but when you use teal, the, the bodies are much softer. You can move the limbs around yeah. and really see how everything works, you know, and move the hands around and things like that. So um, bear in mind that people did donate their bodies. They're always donated free. So um, it, there is a choice for people that they make. And I have made that choice as well. I will donate my body to Dundee University. So there's no question of Burke and Hare being resurrected, if you'll excuse the point. Happily not. No, and there are laws in place to stop that from happening. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Now, Human Tissue us. Act. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Tell us about uh, uh, your organisation. Okay, so the reason that uh, we decided to start this, and it is a collective, um, was... First of all, I was getting very agitated after the, the last election. You know, I, I recognise um, I'm in my early 50s. So, you know, I've been through Thatcher as a teenager um, and I recognised that an 80 seat majority for the Tories was really frightening to me um, and, and the power that they could wield, uh, you know, that obviously we're seeing. Um, so, yeah, that 80 seat majority. I watched an interview with Lisa Nandy on Andrew Marr, and there was a, a point at the interview when Lisa Nandy explained that she couldn't get people to vote for her manifesto in the Labour Party because people were afraid of the deficit and the debt, and they felt that that had to be paid down first. And, and by this time, I knew that that was complete nonsense. Yeah. Um, and I realised at that point the 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 misunderstanding about this particular mm -hmm. thing is skewing our democracy where yeah. people who are normally left wing are voting right wing. Um, and that's that's really a, a big problem now. Okay. Then further down the line, we got COVID um, and really a couple of weeks into COVID, I started to see the mainstream media saying, oh, well, we're just going to have to have more austerity because if we don't, the grandchildren will have to pay. And I also know that that's nonsense as well. So I felt that we had to fight back. Um, and I'm speaking about we as in the group of people that I know who are interested in economics, that are interested in Scottish independence. You know, we communicate with each other. And, you know, I, I said, I, I think we need to some, start some sort of pressure group, some kind of body to do something. And someone said, well, why don't we start a think tank? And, you know, I'm a working class quine from Aberdeen. You know, this seems incredibly grand to me. But at the same time, I'm very aware that the right wing are very happy and very well funded for think tanks. So um, I felt that, you know, yes, we should give it a go. And, um, you know, I, I, I know how to research now. The people that I'm working with do as well. Why not? Let's let's do this and try and debunk some of the uh, orthodox economic myths that have become so prevalent that have wrapped their black tentacles around 
um, everyone to believe that everything that is happening just now just has to be okay. and that we have to do without okay. and we have to put up with things that really we don't have to put up with. Okay. So um, I really wanted to debunk the, uh, the orthodox economic myths because when you learn about orthodox economics, certainly from a, a scientific point of view, some of it is just bizarre. You know, I mean, the, the probably the first thing to think about is the rationality myth, you know, that everyone is, is rational and is, is, is making the best and most rational decision all the time. You know, and I really wonder about, you know, these, these economists that think that, do they don't, they don't go outside, they don't meet people, because certainly, you know, <laughs> most people I've met don't always act rationally all the time. And then other big myths as well are things like um, money is valuable, it's scarce. Money is not scarce. You can make as much money from a treasure from from the, via the treasury to the, the central bank as you want. It's not scarce. Real resources can be scarce, and that's really played out very clearly during this pandemic. Where you know you have our central bank creating more money, but if you don't have PPE in place, it doesn't matter how much money you create. You can't buy it if it's not there, and if you've not prepared for the pandemic. By the way, that was gamed in 2017 by the British government. They knew it was possible. The scientific community knew that a pandemic was overdue. They should have prepared for that. And that is a function of government. They should be preparing for these kind of things. So I really wanted to debunk a lot of the orthodox economic myths so that people, not just, not just in the independence movement, but across Scotland, understood there are things they don't have to accept at all. Okay, Let, let's let's deal with one issue that comes up all the time, <clears throat> and uh, it's a serious one because it, it it causes many people a lot of anguish, and it's this: if you simply print print money, you'll end up a bit like the Weimar Republic, where people had to take their wages home on a Friday evening in a wheelbarrow uh, because there was rampant hyperinflation. Surely all that will happen if you print your own money is you'll end up in exactly that position. What do you say to that? So um, it's not printing money or creating money is probably a better way to, to talk about it because obviously most money nowadays is electronic. Mm -hmm. um, so it's not creating money that creates um, hyperinflation. In the case of the Weimar Republic, um, it was hyperinflation. Mm -hmm. It's a combination of things. So in the case of the Weimar Republic, they lost a lot of their industrial base. They lost resources. And when you're trying to buy resources with money and the resources aren't there, that's the recipe for hyperinflation. So, yeah, the, the political situation came in place first. The government, at the, t uh, the government at the time tried to deal with it by creating money, and it was a sticking plaster. It's, it's not going to work um, you know, they, it's and they didn't understand that. I mean, there's a lot of politicians that we have at the moment that don't really understand how the economy works. They're they're taking advice from people who mostly are coming from an orthodox background. So, but to go back to the Weimar Republic, you can see how if you've not got resources and you're trying to buy them, that's that's the recipe for hyperinflation. Um, so uh, you, you had a small version of inflation with PPE. You know, everyone in the world was trying to buy it after <laughs> COVID. You know, so the prices went up and prices went up in, in certain things, not everything. Um, so, so are you saying that inflation results from uh, too much money chasing too few goods and services? Yes, yes. So if you have a scarcity of resources. And then you create money in the hope that somehow you're going to create these resources. Money can't, it can create resources if it's directed in, if it's put in the right direction. You know, that's for the politicians to work out how they're going to do that. So, you know, for example, you can use money to train nurses. You can use money to train doctors, engineers. You know, you send them to university, you give them a bursary. And then they become a resource for your country. And that's a really important resource when you've got a pandemic. Yeah. Really important resource. Yeah. I, 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 I was interested in your point about politicians might not fully understand how economics works. Uh, and they look to experts for advice. 
And what I was reminded of the lovely story by, I think it was Jim Callaghan when he was prime minister. And he said, you know something, I, my dearest wish in life is for a one-armed economist. And the cabinet secretary said, how would that help, prime minister? And he said, it's dead easy. Every time you bring an economist in here, the first thing they say to me is, on the one hand, prime minister, it could be this. On the other hand, prime minister, it could be that. Send me one guy with just one arm. That's going to help me enormously. Uh, and I, I think that spoke, perhaps in a flippant way, to the fact that politicians do, as you say, have an imperfect understanding of how the economy works. I mean, you, you've only got to look around you to see lots of evidence of that. So how, how, does, uh, how does your organisation address that? I mean, obviously, you, 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 you work together, you, you research together, but what are the practical outcomes well, um, I'm, I'm trying to go around as many yes groups at the moment as I can. Um, I'm also involved in Yes Edinburgh Lothians as well. So, yeah, just trying to get the word out there. Um, we'll probably do more media. We are publishing a paper soon. Um, it will be quite lengthy, probably about 10,000 words on a job guarantee. So we'll do some publicity around that. We're creating articles to kind of simplify economics it's difficult. You can, you know, I've made I've made a little five minute economics in five minutes sheet recently, um, because I've got people who want me to simplify it down more. Um, I have to say that I think on a fundamental level, it's not complicated. You know, there are, there are basic things you've got to understand that fundamentally, you know, in, in, in a successful economy, we're all doing things for each other. Yeah. Um, so. Th those are the kind of concepts that you've got to think about. And also resilience, you know, for example, another um, orthodox way of, orthodox, orth sorry, orthodox way of thinking is, you know, tight supply chains, you know, really efficient, tight supply chains. And again, that's something that's been smashed. You see that tight supply chains in the pandemic, not so good, <laughs> you know. So uh, thinking about resilience within your economy is important as well, you know. And, and maybe it's it's quite important to have steelworks in a country that's an island and that can make boats, for example. And my dad used to con con uh, comment on that. So you know, you need a certain amount of resilience. I mean, it's not the case that probably it's worthwhile making everything that your country absolutely needs, but it's yeah. probably worthwhile making sure you've got the real essentials in oh. place. It, it, I, I, I'd like to ask you some questions now because we're 20 minutes into the show and a whole bunch of people are out there thinking, hold on a second, he hasn't asked them any of the questions yet. So here goes. Here goes. <laughs> um, uh, Mike, Mike has written in uh, and, uh, earlier and he said, uh, he has two questions uh, uh, and because I've been late in bringing these up, I'll, I'll, I'll give him the indulgence of asking both if I may. And it's, the first question is this, Kate Forbes, the finance minister, has recently asked the UK government for £500 million. Uh, she wants the ability to borrow that, that sum of money. The question that Mike is asking is, if an independent Scotland was a sovereign currency issuer, mm -hmm. had its own currency, which is the point you made earlier, uh, uh, does uh, modern monetary theory suggest it has no need to borrow at all? It can just issue sufficient of its own currency to fulfil its needs? Yes, MMT does say that. And uh, MMT is not something that you implement. Um, as Tim said, it is, it's an observation of how countries who have a free-floating fiat currency work. And it's commenting on the fact that the, the professors who I follow and listen to, they're commenting on the fact that, you know, these countries have a lot more fiscal space than a lot of the politicians who are running the country seem to understand. And you can certainly see the fiscal space that's become available suddenly. <laughs> so so lots, lots of fiscal space, it turns out. But in the meantime, we've had 10 years of austerity beforehand, which has meant that uh, people died from starvation, from coldness in their homes, from misery has forced them into, uh, into suicide. And we have more people dying from COVID-19 than needed to die because of the lack of preparedness. But I've digressed, sorry. So moving back to the original question. So are, are we borrowing? That's something that we cover in one of the papers. 
um, a few of the papers. The first one that I wrote was really about the language of money and government accounting, which is really a profit and loss. It's a ledger which the government controls. And, you know, it's, it's not the same as your household. We are currency users. The government is a currency issuer. It's never going to run out of money. Um, it, it's not clever to just create money and, and spend it in stupid things. Um, yes, that can create hyperinflation. But if you, for example, create a lot of money and re-reserve the banks and they hold on to that money as reserves, it's not going to create inflation if it's just sitting in the bank vaults, essentially. I mean, it's electronically sitting there. Yeah. But, you know, that's this is an example of how money creation and hyperinflation don't go together. It's dependent on what you do with the money as well. Mm-hmm. So in, a, in an independent Scotland, yes, we should have our own currency because fundamentally money is a tool for our politicians to create resources like training nurses, doctors, engineers. Um, it's also a, a, a way to pay your civil servants. Um, it's, it also is, you know, you tax people in your currency. You're going to pay not only your civil servants, you're going to pay your benefits, your pensions. And this is why people are going to use your currency. Okay. Um, so it's a tool for politicians to direct their um, ideas and the things that we vote those politicians in for. So if we say we want more nurses trained and ready for the next pandemic, then we say to the politicians, right, okay, then encourage more people to go into nursing. Um, okay. Whether they all want to is a different thing. But, you know, you can get the government to try and do that. So that's, does that help? Have I digress too much? Sorry. No, 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 no. Here's Mike's second question. Uh, he said, look, we've got potholes and roads all over Scotland. People complain all the time. Uh, I, I, certainly that's been my experience. If it's not litter, it's potholes. Uh, and with MMT as an advised way of thinking, which is the expression you used, actually, interesting enough, could an independent Scotland in its own currency create uh, the money to repair and develop Scotland's infrastructure way beyond potholes and in so doing create employment at a time of unemployment. And Absolutely. Do, and do so without borrowing. Absolutely. Absolutely. And again, I would say it's it's not, you, when you create your own currency, it's not like you're going to someone's door and saying, can I have some money, please? You know, you create your currency. So the, the dangers are, are how you use it. You know, you, the, the big danger is inflation, hyperinflation. So in an independent Scotland, I mean, I lived in the Netherlands for five years, a small country with an obscure currency called the Hulder. When I lived there, we changed over to the euro and there was no drama. We just, you know, one day I had Hulders in my bank account, at Abbey and Amro, I think I banked with. Or no, it was Rabobank. And the next day in Rabobank, they were called Euros. And it was very, it was a very smooth transition. There was there was no um, problem with it. Um, again, I've digressed. Sorry, I'm I'm I am a little bit nervous. So get me back to the original point that I'm trying to make. Don't don't worry about it. So okay. the, the resources, yeah, so potholes. Yeah. Um yes, the Netherlands, very well run country, small, obscure currency. It's, you know, how you direct the resources. And if we have enough people who want to fill in potholes for a living, we can pay them to do that if they want to do that, if they're prepared to do that. Okay. We've lost a lot of people in Scotland, though. We're a very small population. And that's got pluses and minuses. You know, obviously, we've got huge amounts of resources in a small population. But also, we need people to do some of the things that are not getting done. OK, a couple of quick comments and a question. Thank you for that. Uh, the two comments are, Alison Clark says, Kieran sounds like a very smart cookie. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, Thank you. Somebody called Tasty Warmer on Twitter says, really enjoying tonight's show. Kieran, so inspiring, gives me hope. There you are. Another question. Are you giving this information to the Scottish government? Have the Scottish government expressed one iota of interest in what you're doing? I have spoken to my MSP, yep. That sounds like, if if you may, please excuse me, it sounds like a politician's answer. (laughs) Uh, Yeah, you know, I... um, Is your MSP a member of the Scottish government? Yes, yes. So, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, I've spoken to my MSP about it and, 
yeah, I, I'm trying to speak to as many people about it as possible. There are MSPs that are very MMT aware. Uh, sorry, there's, uh, there, yes, there are MSPs and MPs in the, in the Scottish National Party that are MMT aware. There are people in the Labour Party that are MMT aware. They understand that, you know, the, the government, you know, in MMT, what it's fundamentally saying is the government creates the money first and then it taxes it back. It's not waiting for our tax returns to decide on its spending. Yeah. And that's incredibly obvious during COVID, but it's, it was also obvious during the Second World War as well. I read Matt McGinn's biography and he talks about how suddenly, you know, no one was unemployed. There was no unemployed guys hanging about the streets anymore. And they managed to raise up Glasgow Green by two feet, I think it was, to put an air raid shelter underneath it. Just like that. Yeah. Suddenly the money was there to do that. So yeah. people who had been unemployed before that, again, was a choice that the government made. There doesn't need to be such a thing as unemployment in a country which has a free-floating free fiat currency like the UK does. Okay. Um, but it doesn't have to happen. Here's another question which relates to the, uh, the, the question about do you think the Scottish government is on board here? Uh, it's this. Uh, uh, you know, what, what, what are the SNP's current view on currency? And what do you think of this, this stance? Okay, so I was at the conference that um, that Tim was at, that he brought his amendment. It was very clear that everyone, that, that, that there was a majority vote for that. So the position is very clear that we want our own currency as soon as practicable. And we can get our own currency in place within about two years. And mm -hmm. setting up a central bank is not rocket science. Okay. Lots of countries smaller than us with less resources have done it quite quickly. Okay, can you give us examples? Um, Estonia. Estonia, okay, okay. So, uh, in fact, Thomas MacArthur on Facebook is like, asking exactly that question. His question is, when will Scotland get its own central bank? Is that after independence? Can it get, can't it be done before independence? And would we need to borrow our own money? Okay, so you can't expect the, the taxpayers in Scotland to vote for a central bank until they've voted for independence. So we have to get independence first. But, you know, people like Tim and people round about him and, you know, myself and my colleagues as well, we're all working on the research for this. Okay. Tim's idea is that we'll get the research in place so it's ready for independence. So we're not, you know, relying on civil servants to draw up the research after independence. The research will be there and be ready. Okay. The questions are coming in thick and fast. Uh... So far, you're, out, you're outscoring Tim, and you, you've got lots of questions. <laughs> uh, here's, if countries, Nancy McIntosh on Facebook is asking this question. I suspect she, she speaks for many, frankly. Uh, if countries can just create money, why then did Greece need to be bailed out by the EU? Well, uh, Greece is in the same, is the same situation as Scotland. It's, not, it's, a, it's a currency user. It's not a currency creator. The creator of the currency in the EU is the European Central Bank. Now, um, it's not even really controlled by the European uh, MEPs. Uh, they don't direct what the European Central Bank does in the way that the MPs direct what the Treasury and the Bank of England does here. Um, so, Greece, yeah, it's it's a. Uh, I notice with my Dutch friends even, there's a little bit of a narrative building up there in the north of Europe that somehow they are the people that are the savers and the industrious people. But, you know, as I point out to my Dutch friends, they're also really into tax havenry. They hide the money uh, of the wealthy Greeks and uh, the wealthy Italians up in the Netherlands and, and in Germany, I think, as well. Um, I'm not so clear about that, but I know it's, the Netherlands are a very serious tax haven, just as, as we are very much involved in tax havenry in the UK as well. So um, why, why did they have to borrow? They don't, is the short answer. Um, the, probably the best thing for, Greek, the, 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 for Greece to go back and using the drachma. Yeah, that, that, that's essentially what uh, modern monetary theory would say. Mm -hmm. uh, if, if you're not uh, uh, if you're not an issuer, you're yeah. in deep it, it. it would it would be better for that. Well, you know, having your own currency yeah. makes you fiscally sovereign. Yeah. They're not fiscally sovereign anymore. Oh, 
of course, I can imagine lots of people in the audience thinking to themselves, whoa, hey, hold it a second. If we do go down this route that Karen and others are recommending, why in any sane world would we want to join the euro? Well, that my, my opinion is um, I wouldn't be keen to give up monetary and fiscal sovereignty once we've attained it. Um, you know, and certainly, you know, in the UK, the UK didn't give up its monetary and fiscal sovereignty either, neither has Sweden. So you can be in the EU. You don't necessarily have to use the currency. You don't have to use the euro. But, you know, there are countries, there are several countries that are not using the, the euro. Yeah. Isn't there a mandatory requirement to join the euro? No. No. There is. No. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Um, uh, Martin McPhee on Facebook is asking, would you need to control immigration if, if we ran a successful job guarantee scheme? Well, Scotland is underpopulated. Um, we really need young people moving over here, especially if they can still make babies. <laughs> you know, that, you know, it would be really good to have a lot more young people because we have an old, older aging population. So we need people. I mean, certainly, uh, you know, since the Act of Union in 1707, at that time, we were 20% of the UK population. We're now 8%. And again, like I said, you know, there are pluses. So there's lots of resources for a small population. But then there's, you know, we, we're, we're lacking people to do certain things as well, you know. So okay. there's Here's a balance a question, to be uh, found. <clears throat> uh, Tom MacArthur uh, on Facebook is asking, uh, we got our own parliament, so why can't we vote to have our own central bank now? Well, well, that would give us independence. And of course, we haven't voted for that yet. We didn't vote for it in 2014, alas. Um, well, but, you know... That would be his question. Maybe his question is, look, we've got our own parliament. Why can't we have our own central bank? What's to stop that from happening? Well, that would be independence, having our own central bank. If we were issuing our own currency, that would be we would be you know we would be sovereign again. Okay. okay. The, the, you know, so we we haven't voted for that. Okay. I, I, I think, judging by the tone of the questions, I suspect some people are, are beginning to uh, agonise more deeply about the length of time this is all taking. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, there's 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 a strong opinion out there amongst the yes community that hey, come on, you know, with the internal market bill. Uh, you know, it's 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 now going to happen by the looks of it, unless the House of Lords cuts up rough, and even then, who knows what might happen. But assuming it goes ahead, effectively, that's the end of devolution. It's it's just gone. Forget it. It's it, it. so. In other words, uh, the argument would, would run: Why are we waiting? Why don't we do something right now uh, that prevents the internal market uh, legislation being enacted in Scotland? Because it's going to have such deleterious consequences uh, for, for everyone. What, what's your view on that? I don't know what we do about that. I, you know, I, I, I don't have an answer. You know, I would, you know, th this is really something for people that are more interested in, in the law. Um, and happily, we still have our own uh, legal system in Scotland. Um, you know, so this is really something that the lawyers are going to have to look at as well. That's, that's really something for them. I don't know what we're going to do about that. I mean, I, I don't know. I, I don't know if you remember after 2014, there was two young guys in George Square. And, you know, I felt this very strongly when they were being interviewed and they said, bring on your worst. You're going to bring on the worst. And this guy said, my mum's a nurse. She's going to lose her job. And I really felt his pain, you know, as a working class woman uh, coming from a working class background. We have been the canaries in the mine for neoliberalism. And I have not lived at the sharpest end, but I've lived at a fairly sharp end of neoliberalism. Mm -hmm. So when people voted no in 2014, that was exactly how I felt. I thought, the right wing now have carte blanche to walk all over Scotland. There are people who voted no who didn't understand that that would happen. They were not politically aware. They're busy with their lives in other ways. They're not really that interested in politics. But when things start to hurt, you know, and suddenly your partner or your husband or wife from France or Italy, 
they start to be treated as someone else. And then the pandemic hits and you realise that this government are incompetent. Um, so, you know, more and more people are starting to really wake up to the politics of what's happening in this country. You know, I'm interested in politics. Yeah. And, you know, I, I have a background where I would be interested in. I was, we discuss politics over the kitchen table at home. But that's not everyone. So, I know, yeah, I, know. I, I, I honestly don't know, John. I know. I know a lot of people are bored by politics. Let's be, let's be candid. Uh, there's folks like ourselves who debate and this program and all the rest of it, which is super. I, I, I love this. I enjoy it immensely. But I, I also recognize there's a whole bunch of folks out there, if I could care less, uh, and their only contact with politics occasionally, dare I say it, is a pothole. <laughs> and was, they're much more ag agonizing, agonized about a pothole in Leith Walk than they are about Scotland losing its sovereignty. Uh, and the mass media perhaps don't help in that because there's an educational job to be done. Uh, but I want, I want to ask you, uh, 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 I want to task you on a, a point you made there. You said it's the right wing uh, that, that are pushing this agenda. The reality is, though, that the Labour Party, under its present leadership, is almost indistinguishable in its attitude to our Scotland. So it's not really just a right wing thing, is it? Yeah. I mean, you know, the Labour Party have moved to the right. That's why a lot of people in Scotland don't go with them anymore they're too right wing for the people in scotland you know we we voted for left-wing labor and that ceased that has ceased to be you know they've taken on the neoliberal clothes um i read andrew Tickell in the national he calls it triangulation it's whereby you know you try and take the clothes of your opponents in order to gain power and then after a while you've taken on so many of their clothes that you can barely tell the difference and that's the well, situation that's, that's, we're in now there and it's the same in america that's interesting because triangulation was probably brought to its highest level in terms of implementation, if not in theory, was with Bill Clinton. Because Bill Clinton figured out he did the opinion polls, he could read them better than most of his advisors. And what they said to him was, if you go out with a left-wing agenda, you're going to get the Democrats are not going to get elected. So he was able to sell this package, which is that you have to be fiscally right-wing but you can be liberal in terms of social policy. And he tried to pull off that trick. The trouble is if once you go down, as you say, you go down that route, uh, which I guess is what Keir Starman is going to find as well, is that you do end up compromised. You, you, you do lose a big chunk of your possible uh, support uh, and you do pick up a whole chunk of somewhat fragile support. You know, and I understand that he's looking at the same opinion polls as everyone else, and right now, he'll be telling himself, I suspect, that triangulation works. Because if you look at the present opinion polls, the Labour and Tory parties are running neck and neck. So that speaks to his, his approach and his attitude towards these issues. Uh, and now, the likelihood is that having pulled off that trick, he's not going to revert back to anything else. <laughs> that would be crazy. You spent all that time and energy convincing a lot of people who are soft Tories to vote for you it would be crazy to suddenly throw that baby out of the bathwater and say, right, we're all going to be uh, very touchy-feely and we're going to get in touch with social causes. I mean, you may pay lip service to it from time to time if that suits the purpose, if he happens to be in Scotland or the north of England, perhaps. Uh, but uh, beyond that, it's difficult to see how you can, you can move on from that. Uh, yeah, I think also as well, I mean, what my hope and prayer is that is when people start to understand how how the country is run uh, with the free floating currency that we have, that people st start to see the blurring of lines between what right and left wing is, you know, and also the other thing is at the moment, you know, the, the, the fight between the concept of, you know, well, I, I want my taxes to do this and I want my taxes to do that. And there's a left wing thinking about that and a right wing thinking about that. That if people really understood how the fiscal and monetary system worked, they would understand that their perceptions about that are really quite wrong. And the other thing, it's like I saw a video recently and it was a picture of two deer uh, in Africa and they had their horns locked into each other. And while they've got their horns locked into each other, there's a big lion coming down a hill. And that big lion is climate change. And, yeah. you know, we've, we've, we're seeing, you know, Australia has lost a tract of land the size of Ireland and all the flora and fauna in there. America's on fire. Uh, southern, southern Yorkshire flooded. 
You know, yes. the, this is this is coming our way, and we we have to get over these petty right wing, left wing uh, thinking and start thinking about together how we're going to save ourselves, uh, yeah. save people from the effects of climate change and the yeah. planet. Um, yeah, so I think that's a very good point. I mean, it's a, the the uh, the image that brought it home to me was was a, a huge tidal wave approaching people squabbling over uh, bits and pieces who knows in the foreground um thinking more more generally about a uh, uh, the, the point you raised earlier uh, which i'd like to ask you to look at in a bit more detail please you you strongly suggested that austerity was a choice not a requirement what's your rationale for that statement well, austerity was it, you, the idea that we have to give up on services in order to pay down the debt. So why are we paying down the debt? Why are we doing that? You know, the, the government has had a debt for over 300 years. It, it creates a slightly bigger debt every year. That's called the deficit. So the deficit is the yearly debt and then the, uh, the 300 odd yearly debt is called the debt. But again, it, is, it, is it debt when, if you're in a position where you're printing your own money in your garage, um, and that's illegal, by the way, you can't do that, are you going to be in debt? So it's, it's, you know, it's the wrong way of thinking about government finance. It's not the same as our situation as currency users. Yeah. So I think, again, I think I've dig digressed massively, John. Do well, I need to say something else there? The point is essentially: is austerity a choice, or, or is it? Yes, it is a choice. It is a choice, absolutely. So There's, pain, you know, let me get this right. So you're saying that all that pain and suffering that was produced by austerity was unnecessary. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So why do they want to pay off the debt? What's? Well, it's, it's not really a debt in the sense that we have debts in our households. Um, you know, and it's been accumulating and it continues to accumulate. Is that a problem? Um, Japan is running a, a deficit at the moment, about 200, 200, 200. No, I think it's approaching 300 percent of GDP. Yeah. So it's it's understanding what your fiscal space is. And obviously, if you've got more fiscal space, if you've got lots of resources and, you know, we're not short of resources in the UK, we've got an educated population, loads of energy. Initially, we've had oil. We're going to move to. I, I noticed Boris is talking up the amount of renewable energy we've got in North Britain. <laughs> so you know we've we've got lots of really essential resources. We've got them, and lots of non-essential resources. We've got them as well. Yeah. So no, we didn't need austerity. That was a choice. The government made that choice. That is. They, they think that they have to pay, some of these politicians think they have to pay the deficit down for the reasons that we mentioned earlier, they're worried about inflation, but actually we've had problems with deflation over the past few while. So, you know, actually that, again, that's not paying attention to what's actually happening in the real economy. Yeah. So yeah, you, people have died because of austerity yeah. and I really want to stop that from happening. I really want people to understand you do not have to accept austerity. I mean, how can you accept austerity when one trillion is being offshored every year in one trillion dollars? And a lot of that is coming from the UK and being facilitated by the UK. Mm -hmm. you, you said that the UK has <coughs> accumulated debt <coughs> of many thousands of millions of pounds <coughs> over the last 300 years, for example. Trillions. Is that money owed? Say that again? To whom is that money owed? To it's not owed to anyone. So when people buy bonds, this is this is what's called government debt. Um, the the treasury the treasury creates bonds, and um, they're sold initially to the big banks. And um, the the bond market's always oversubscribed because people with more than eighty five thousand pounds, because obviously you're insured in a normal bank up to eighty five thousand pounds. If you've got more money than that, then you can save your money in the safest bank account in the land, which is the Bank of England. So if you've got more than £85,000, yeah, you can buy bonds. And the great thing about buying that form of money, which is what bonds are, is unlike the normal pounds that I've got in my purse, bonds are interest yielding. So when they cash them in, the government creates a little bit more money. 
And then you've got people who've got lots of money getting even more money from bonds. If, that, if that's the case, uh, the Bank of England has recently announced that they're looking at uh, uh, negative income. So in other words, there'll, there'll be negative interest on bonds. So why yeah, so would they buy a bond if, if they're going to lose money on it? Because it's a safe place to put your huge amounts of cash. I mean, not not all bonds are people with huge huge amounts of cash. It's 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 unfair to paint it that way. But that that's what it mostly is. And you have um, you know insurance companies and pension firms. They are investing. I know pension firms are about thirty to forty percent in bonds because it's a safe place yeah. to store large amounts of money, um, and it will pay off interest. So. In that sense, you know, it's it's maybe not necessarily very wealthy people, okay. but you know, it's people with extra cash are getting more cash from the Bank of England. Here's a question that's that's cropped up, and this is this is not an unusual question, by the way, because people are very confused about debt, deficit. To whom are all these thousands of millions of pounds owed? <laughs> it's not owed. It's not again, and I, I wrote an article about the language around money. You know, you could you could call the you could call the deficit the private sector surplus. Okay, so this this question uh, is: Wouldn't our lives vastly improve if the UK debt was paid off tomorrow? No, because again, if what. What the government's doing, it spends money out into the economy. So it spends money out, for example, on buying hospitals, equipping hospitals, staffing hospitals. It creates the currency to pay for those things, and a proportion of that is taxed back. And that's what the deficit is. It's, you know, you have to think about the plumbing of money. Where does money come from? It comes from the government. The government creates it. Banks can create money as well. That will happen if I go and borrow money to buy a house or to expand my business. Um, But that's a debt to me. Whereas if I have civil servants who are clients and their pay trickles down to me, that's not a debt. That's my um, surplus. So I prefer government debt (laughs) to my debt. (laughs) And everyone should. (laughs) And unless it's causing inflation... We like government debt. Yeah. yeah. I much prefer it to my debt. Okay, cool. Um, here's another question which bears on that. It also bears on your points about uh, an independent Scotland and the currency and all the rest of that good stuff. Uh, the question is, does Karen think Scotland has a deficit like the UK government says it does? Scotland doesn't have a deficit because it's not a currency issuer. It, does, it certainly doesn't have a trade deficit. We have a trade surplus. And that's from the little information we've got because the statistics that are held are not particularly good. But we're pretty confident from the research that Business for Scotland have done. They've done loads of research into this. They've shown the massive amount of resources that Scotland has got, that we have a trade surplus. Um, we don't have a, a fiscal deficit because we're not a currency issuer. We get pocket money from Westminster and that's all we've got. And that's why Kate Forbes is asking for more pocket money. Um, The the Westminster, the the Treasury, the Bank of England, there's no problem creating money. It's literally created from keystrokes at a computer at the Bank of England. Mm. That's how it's created. If if someone else creates it, that's that's you, you you can go to jail for doing that. So there's a reason why people just don't randomly create money. It's it's long, lengthy jail sentences. Yeah. I think I think the isn't the modern terminology for creating money quantitative and easy. So you can the, the the bank can create money anyway, but quantitative easing is 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 cashing in your bonds. So you you know you're buying back your bonds and giving people who have got bonds money. Um and you know, so okay. So it, what, yeah. what happened in, in 2008? The banks were falling like nine pins all over the place uh, and across countries, and then it was mm-hmm. grievous in the mm-hmm. states. And the US authorities, I think the Federal Reserve, uh, created overnight. There was mm-hmm. no tax increase. Mm-hmm. There was no uh, no other uh, device used. It was done at a stroke. In fact, when the when they, when they were asked, the executives were asked, Where, how, how did you print all this money overnight to rescue the banks? And they said, we don't, we don't print money, we press a button on a keyboard. That's it. Yeah. 
Yeah. Is that what you're referring to when you talk about uh, a currency issuer can mm-hmm. conjure money up out of thin air? Mm. Or- yeah, you really have to remember, I think also as well, a lot of people have forgotten this or are not aware of this. The, the gold standard stopped in 1971. You know, it's, it, money is not inherently valuable. It's, it's a tool to distribute resources, it's a store of value, um, you know, we, we, a, a tool of exchange, but it doesn't have an inherent value. Like you, you can't go into a bank now and take 20 pounds in and say, give me 20 pounds of gold. You're not going to get that. It's not backed by anything. It's backed by its, a, it's a promise to pay. Yeah. Um, and, you know, it has, your government money has a high degree of moneyness um, you could describe it as that as well. So, you, you know, your bank money is slightly less degree of moneyness. Um, and something like Bitcoin, well, that, you know, if you if you lose your Bitcoins, no one's going to give you that back. You know, if, you, if you're in a normal bank with normal money, you're insured up to £85,000. And as I say, if you've got more than that, then the bonds are a safe place to store your money. Um, a not so safe place is the market. You can invest in different companies. Some people might want to do that if they have excess money. They could do that. So um, it's you know different things have different degrees of moneyness. And um, Tim touched on this as well. You know you, you can exchange things with people, and creating money is not a problem. It's having it accepted, and government has so much behind it that that's why it's accepted. Um, so are you saying that? Money is based on confidence. And there was yeah, a- yeah. So you you really want your com- country not to be a basket case. Okay. Really. Okay. <laughs> you, want, you want to have a successful country with great infrastructure, happy people, educated people. Yeah. Um, educated people, really important in the modern world as well. You know, that we, we, we are learning all the time and um, keeping up with the rest of the world as well. So that's yeah. really important. Uh, let me just pick up because we've been asked a question about Bitcoin. Uh, are you suggesting that Bitcoin is not safe? No, it's not. <laughs> okay. Why isn't it safe? Well, it's not backed by anything. So our, our money is backed by the government. But Bitcoin, if you lose your Bitcoins, no one's going to give you any more. Okay. Okay. Uh, Craig Whereas if the, ba- if the banks mess up, which is what they did in 2008, people that had up to £85,000 were insured by the government. And if the banks did not were not able to pay that money out, then the Bank of England would create money so that they had that money. Okay, Tom MacArthur, I hope that was an answer to your question. Uh, Craig Berry on YouTube is asking, if we can create a job guarantee, what would that look like for ordinary people? Okay, so Craig... <laughs> Craig is on our board, and uh, it's important oh, to bring up the job guarantee. Oh. <laughs> so, um, yeah, so the job guarantee, we're working on a paper for that. Um, I, and I'm hoping that, John, maybe you would get either Craig or Cameron or maybe both of them to come on and talk about the job guarantee, because really that's their baby. They've written that paper. Um, so there's an awful lot to say about that. And in fact, that could do a whole show. So, um, yeah, job guarantee is something that we are writing about and um, really important for an independent Scotland as well. Because fundamentally, the idea behind that is that the, the private market, well, it's not interested in creating employment. It's interested in profit. So frequently, the people that are left at the bottom and are made unemployed most quickly are people with less skills. Yeah. Um, and again, you know, that's that's subjective. And I think people with the, the pandemic have really understood that. But it's to ensure that people are never out of work by choice for any length of time and that they have what's called a transition job between maybe going back to the, the, the private sector or maybe going to a public sector job in the future as well if they wanted to do that. So there's always something for someone to do. And, that you know, the planet's burning. There's loads to do. Okay. Uh, that moves neatly into um, a supplementary to a question that Tim was asked last week. Um, it, he was slightly unenthusiastic about a universal income because he felt it might be exploited by uh, some employers, not all, by any means, some employers, 
to as a surplus, uh, I, uh, as a uh, as some some means of uh, uh, compensating them th through the state, uh, so that they wouldn't have to uh, pay it to employees. They would just subtract it, in fact, from somebody's wage because they would say, "Well, you're you're a beneficiary of the universal income. That's a subsidy for me. Thank you very much, but you're not going to get any more from it." Uh, uh, but he didn't say he was unenthusiastic in, in principle. I don't think. What's your take on universal income? Well, I think in an independent Scotland, we don't need to have anyone unemployed. I mean, as I say, if we have our own currency, we can employ everyone. And, you know, as I say, we have a small population and there's a lot to do. So, you know, I would say, especially to independent supporters, that, you know, in an independent Scotland, there will be a lot to do. There will be shoulders to the wheels um, in order to make things happen. You know, certainly... You know, I've, I look at civil service jobs and I see there's often a lot of vacancies there. Um, you know, we don't have enough people to do all the things that we need to do. And, you know, certainly looking at have, living in the Netherlands and really realising, you know, this is how a modern economy should be. This is how Scotland should look. This is, you know, we should have these things in Scotland. We've got more resources than the Netherlands. Why is it not like this in Scotland? Yeah. And if we want to make our country into the modern European country that they want to make it, it's a lot of work to be done and a lot of civil service jobs to be made. And with our own currency, we can do that. Well, you could argue there's 300 years to make up. Uh, it, there is, you know. And I mean, also, I, I did say at the beginning, I lived in London for eight years and, you know, you could really see that a lot of deficit spending was happening in London and the South East. I mean, it's a different life. It's, it's just crazily different from Scotland. Um, and certainly, you know, when I saw Craig DL talk from Commonweal, he explained, he looked at the statistics and Eurostat make it quite plain that, you know, deficit spending has, a lot more deficit spending has been happening there. It's well, very unequal in this country. It's the most unequal country in the EU. It's an, it's a, it's a, an ill-divided world and perhaps an even more ill-divided country. Uh, we're almost out of time. Uh, this has been very interesting. Uh, if people want to know more, they can go to your website, Modern www.modernmoney.scot. Um, we've, we've got a dot .scot domain, of course we have. <laughs> we are pro-independence. <laughs> We're not going to hide that. There you are. That's very important because we've, in some way, uh, no disrespect to uh, Karen, because we've covered a lot of ground tonight. We probably, you would probably agree, we've probably scratched the surface a little bit. We've gotten into depth on one or two things, but there's lots of other great information available. Do go to the site. You know how to contact you. Find out how to contact Karen and our colleagues as well. So if you're interested in this subject, and I suggest you ought to be interested, there's that's one of the places to go. If you want to look at the Growth Commission, you go back and look at Andrew Wilson's interview uh, when he was a guest and also to the appropriate website there. Uh, a big thank you. A big thank you to Karen. And a big thank you to all of you for watching tonight. We hope you've enjoyed the Nation Talks as ever. We continue to have a formidable list of guests. And next week, another cracking show. We have Ian Blackford, the Nation Talks, Ian Blackford MP, who, of course, is the leader of the SNP group at Westminster. So get your questions in for Ian and join us next Wednesday at 7 p.m. for the Nation Talks to Ian Blackford. Oh, as always, do look out for the Constitution column in the Sunday National this weekend. And very importantly, continue, please, to support Indie Live. These folks do a fantastic job. And they need your support, and I'm sure they would welcome your support. And thanks again, and good night. Join us next Wednesday, and remember, it's been a great day for British democracy. Good night, all. Thanks, John. <laughs>
This is a new voice for a new Scotland. We are an internet radio station and you can find us at www.indielive.radio. We are a community of volunteer broadcasters set up in 2019 to entertain and inform. Click on the schedule tab to find out what's on every day of the week. You'll see what a great variety of shows we have, and we're on 24-7. There's something for everyone, so please give us a try. We know you're busy people, so most of our shows are also on demand on our Scottish Independence podcast channel, available wherever you get your podcasts. Indie Live Radio is a new voice for a new Scotland. Join us. Thanks for listening. The What's On Guide to live stream events and shows is now available. You can find the guide on the web at independencelive.net, on multiple Facebook pages, or go direct with the web link tvl.ink forward slash What's On Guide. Independence Live. That's where you'll find the footage. What's On Guide to live stream events and shows is now available. You can find the guide on the web at independencelive.net, on multiple Facebook pages, or go direct with the web link tvl.ink forward slash What's On Guide. Hi there, I'm, I'm Cliff. And I'm Russ. And I'm from, we're from the Veterans for Scottish Independence 2.0 group. And uh, we're just invading your privacy today to, to let you know that we will be uh, very shortly uh, pushing a programme out on live stream uh, to do with uh, uh, the veterans, uh, their needs, uh, as it will be uh, during an independent campaign. Uh, sorry, the next independence campaign, uh, and indeed in the independence Scotland. So get yourself in gear, come and join us, pull up a sandbag. Yes. Thank you. Cheers. Wherever you stand, get the fresh view of what's happening in Scotland with iScot. Celebrate everything about our country with intelligent, in-depth insight from lifestyle, culture to puzzles and all the opinions you'll need. Whether it's digital or by post, subscribe now to iScot.